My name is Jason Cannon with the Institute for Humane Studies, and it's our privilege to be joined by Professor Steve Davies for his third and final lecture of the seminar titled Time to Revive Individualism. Steve. Thanks very much, Jason. Well, uh, what I'm going to argue in this talk uh, is that, as the title says, it's time to revive what was at one time a widely known, widely used, and widely understood political label, the label of individualism and individualist, to describe the people who adhered to that ideology. Now, what's in a name? Why should names, the names that you give to political ideas or political movements, why should they actually matter? Surely a name is just a label. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the substantive content. But actually, uh, because names are used in communication, they do matter. <clears throat> now, the first thing to point out is that, as it says here, names or labels are often given by opponents uh, and then adopted by the people that they're uh, put onto. So two classic examples, of course, from British history, are Whig and Tory. Uh, Whig meant a Scottish outlaw, Tory meant an Irish robber. So these were terms of opprobrium which the people they were put onto then took up as badges of pride and they just became regular labels with an understood meaning. But many, many other examples of this. Uh, it could well be, for example, at the moment that the term neoliberal uh, comes to be taken up by some of the people it's ascribed to and they adopted it as a badge of honor. Uh, you know, stranger things have happened. So that's something that often happens. On the other hand, sometimes the name or label is initially used or developed by the people to whom it refers. They adopt it themselves as a label uh, and use it as a kind of way of identifying themselves and typically also of marking themselves off from other maybe similar or apparently similar intellectual tendencies or groups. Now, what happens when this, either of these processes happen is that the term in question comes to have a range of accepted meanings. And these meanings crucially are defined by the way they are used in conversation, which means that they are defined both by the people to whom they refer, whether they've invented it themselves or adopted it, and the people who are uh, arguing with them, their interlocutors or critics, uh, who may often uh, use the term as well. And so terms are always fluid and always, in some sense, negotiable. Uh, now, what happens, though, is that very often the way the word is used in the wider discourse comes to be internalized by the people to whom it refers. So sometimes the way that the word is used, the range of meanings that have come to be associated with a word come to be internalized, actually picked up and adopted by the people to whom it refers. Now, this can be a good thing, but it can also be, in some cases, a bad thing. Uh, and also, there's a matter of projection. Now, what I mean by that is this. The image that the particular label, a political movement or ideology has, will tend to project out or uh, be seen as associating that movement and ideas with certain concrete things certain ideas maybe, certain concrete historical or contemporary political figures perhaps, uh, and very often what this means is that you attract, if you're in the movement that's labelled in this way, you attract the attention or the support of certain people even if you may not want it. Now that's unfair, uh, but it's real. You can't um, you know, do away with it because, as I say, it's driven by social discourse, which is something that ultimately is extremely hard to control. Now, the question then, which has been much argued about amongst uh, the kind of people who are attending these seminars and giving lectures at these seminars, is what name to call ourselves, and it's a bit of a conundrum. Uh, this is the question. Say you believe in a politics and a political philosophy of strictly limited government, personal liberty and autonomy, and voluntarism. Voluntarism meaning the principle that society should be organized to the greatest degree possible on the basis of voluntary cooperation rather than uh, power relations. What do you call yourself? This is quite uh, a problem in the contemporary world. Uh, lots of other names given, uh, such as neoliberal at the moment, for example, uh, but the, for various reasons, nobody apart from a few odd people has actually gone the route of adopting these terms of opprobrium as an actual badge of pride. Now, at one time in the 19th century, the word for people who had that particular combination of use was quite straightforward. You just used the term liberal. 
Uh, that was the kind of word that would have been used in the middle of the 19th century and in many parts of Europe well into the 20th century. But it's no longer uh, a useful label in that regard. Now, there's one particular problem in the United States, which is that in the United States, from about the 1920s through to until really the last seven or eight years, maybe no more than that, the term liberal came to refer to what in Europe was generally known as social democracy. So to define yourself as a liberal meant that everybody thought uh, that this referred to somebody who supported redistributive and fairly high levels of taxation, a pretty active regulatory role for the government, and a bunch of other stuff like that. As I said before, this is unfair. You may deny till you're blue in the face that that's what you actually think, but the problem is that the public discourse in America had attached that meaning very firmly to the word liberal. It's beginning to disappear, that problem, uh, because the kind of people who used to describe themselves as liberals are increasingly now using the term progressive to describe their position, which is actually the original name they gave to themselves before they picked up the liberal one in the 1920s. So that is beginning to pass. However, elsewhere, uh, in Europe, for example, although you don't have that problem, everyone knows in Europe that a liberal and a social democrat are different animals. The problem is that the word liberal is too capacious because it includes both revisionist liberals and classical liberals, if you will. It includes both uh, liberals who accept a fairly expansive role for the political sphere and those who are against it. So in the Netherlands, for example, you have two liberal political parties, the Party for Freedom and Democracy, VVD, which is very much a limited government uh, liberal party. And then you have the D66, which is uh, very much a kind of more social liberal party, but they're both recognised as being liberal parties. So the term is a bit too woolly, a bit too capacious, a bit too portmanteau. Uh, you need to always qualify it to explain what it is you actually mean. Now, in America, since the 1940s or 1950s, the term conservative is often used. Uh, but there's all kinds of problems with this. There's an inherent uh, tension between the underlying conversations, if you will, of liberalism and conservatism, because conservatism essentially is about is scepticism about the modern world in some ways, a perception that something has been lost in modernity as well as much gained. And it's also, as the name suggests, about preserving or conserving uh, a particular way of life, uh, a particular kind of social, intellectual, cultural inheritance, if you will. That's problematic in itself in the United States for various complicated reasons, uh, but also in the context of the United States, uh, that means that people, if you describe yourself as a conservative, you are associated with all kinds of people who are quite clearly not liberal in any meaningful sense of that word. Uh, and unfortunately, this is the term that people who are not themselves supporters of the uh, combination of views that I put at the top there, that's the term that tends to be used to describe people who adhere to that. And what that means is that a whole lot of assumptions are then projected onto you. It means that it's assumed, for example, that if you are in favour of a strictly limited government, personal autonomy, voluntarism, make market economy as well, it's assumed, therefore, that you are also probably uh, in favour of traditional sexual morality and the state enforcing that sexual morality, that you're in favour of a particular and rather hard take on criminal justice enforcement, uh, you're probably opposed to immigration. Uh, again, you can then sort of deny till you're black in the face that uh, that is uh, not what you are. The problem is that if you allow yourself to be uh, described or labelled with the moniker conservative, those are the kind of views that are going to be associated with you, uh, because that's what the term means in common discourse. And so the two favoured terms now, as I'm sure you all know, are libertarian and classical liberal. Uh, but these also have problems, some are long-standing, some more recent. So why not classical liberal? This is the term that I often use myself. It's the one that I would be least uncomfortable with, and it's the one I think that uh, most people coming from that particular political position would use, particularly in the academy. Uh, here's some of the good things about it, or specific things about it. The term classical liberal has a specific historical referent. It refers to a, a political movement, a movement of ideas, uh, in a specific historical time period, between roughly 1770 and 1870, or perhaps the 1890s. Uh, it's the liberalism of the Scottish Enlightenment, of Adam Smith, of Gladstone, of Grover Cleveland, Bourbon Democrats. Uh, it's a liberalism 
very much of that era and the ideas that first found expression and gained political victories during that era. Now, this has both good and bad consequences, that reference. On the one hand, it means the advantage that you're associated with, by using this term, a glorious tradition in history. You're associated with all kinds of uh, people who are well thought of generally today. It means you're associated with uh, a whole body of very rich intellectual arguments, very strong political arguments, and also a history generally of uh, very profound uh, victories in the course of the last 150 years, uh, as I was mentioning in my first lecture. Uh, it is worth saying that a lot of the intellectual tradition that this refers to, that was developed in that 100-year period, uh, is now half forgotten uh, and actually badly needs to be revived. Things like the theory of class conflict, which most of the liberals of that era just assumed and took for granted, which is why very often they didn't even spell it out. They just used expressions like the industrious classes, and they knew exactly what that was alluding to, as did their readers. Uh, so it's a rich intellectual tradition. Uh, some of which, as I say, needs to be revived. So that's a good thing about it. But the problem is, it implies that you're basically still talking about that. If you say that you are a Gladstonian liberal, the sort of implication of that way of thinking about yourself and labelling yourself is that you're still putting forward the kind of politics that the Gladstonian Liberal Party or the Democratic Party of Grover Cleveland was putting forward in the latter part of the 19th century. And of course, this is simply not true, because the ideas that we're talking about have passed on. They've been inherited by later generations of scholars. Uh, they have been changed and developed. Uh, and it, sure enough, you can say, oh, well, they're still classical liberal ideas. But the problem is that the whole term and even the use of words like classical implies that what you're doing is some talking about a tradition that's been handed on like a kind of Olympic torch, if you will, uh, and which hasn't uh, developed over that time. This, this again is unfair, but uh, it's a very common association. And it means that therefore there's an implication, as it says here, of nostalgia and traditionalism. The implication of calling yourself a classical liberal very often is that you really would like to go back to the 19th century. The implication is that you think things were really cool in the years before maybe 1913, uh, in the 19th century, the year after the Civil War, uh, but that since then it's been downhill all the way. Uh, and that is both a ridiculous assertion to make on a whole number of grounds, and it's one that's going to make a whole lot of people uh, automatically discount anything you have to say, because they're very much aware of how in all sorts of ways uh, things have got better since then, uh, particularly for them. So if you're an African-American, for example, or a woman, uh, you're not going to be impressed if you think that the person you're talking to is somebody who thinks that the ideal society or the ideal state of affairs was the one that existed uh, in the later 19th century when you had Jim Crow and when women did not have the vote uh, and suffered from all kinds of legal disabilities. That's just one example. There are other examples of that kind of problem. Now, very often, uh, classical liberal is used as a synonym for being pro market. Two problems with that. One of them, which I've already alluded to, is that it is not only classical liberals in this sense who are pro-market. There are also many conservatives who are, or were anyway, uh, and that means you run the risk of being confused with them. But also, more importantly, support for free trade uh, and a free market economy was only a part of the whole classical liberal package. And the danger of allowing that kind of association to come in is that it leads people to think that that's all you care about. <clears throat> that that is the totality of your politics, free market economics. Uh, and that's a very dangerous kind of assumption uh, to let take root, as well as being untrue. What about libertarian, which is the alternative term that began to be widely used in the United States, although the word itself, as I'll explain in a moment, goes back a long way before then uh, in the post-war period, and particularly since the 1960s. Well, the word is actually in use as a political label from a very early date. Uh, you can find uses of the word libertarian in English literature uh, and in uh, political commentary from the late 19th century, actually. Uh, one of the earliest uses, by the way, is in a well-known Victorian pornographic novel called Venus in the Country, uh, where the leading character, Pamela, is described as being one of those libertarians 
who thought that everyone should be allowed to do what they liked so long as they did not hurt anyone in doing it. Uh, pretty good definition, you might say. This is just after she's been invited to take part in an orgy. Uh, and th that, that's an early use of the term, very early, in fact. Uh, and it shows you how the word was understood at the time. Uh, it meant, as it says here, a commitment to a radical understanding of personal liberty. Uh, that's what the term libertarian was commonly understood as meaning from uh, about the middle of the 19th century onwards, really. It also had the more specific meaning of a socialist or communist anarchist, an anarchist like Peter Kropotkin or Enrico Malatesta, who believed in a stateless society without money uh, and markets, a communist anarchist. Uh, particularly in France, that was how the term was used. So it had those two meanings. Uh, now, what that means is that it has a meaning at that time similar to the one we have uh, now but also different in a certain way because of that specific uh, secondary meaning that it had but there's a problem in here in this term now it's restricted today in the way it's used in a way that is the mirror image of the problem with classical liberalism in a lot of popular discourse and indeed academic discourse the word libertarian is used to refer purely to the social side of things uh, so it's the mirror image of the problem you have with describing yourself as a classical liberal if you say you're a libertarian people will correctly say that you're in favor of a very expansive uh, defense of free speech that you favor personal liberty in private matters uh, sexual matters a whole range of other things uh, but they might not uh, associate that with some of the other things that you would wish to associate with yourself, such as support for very limited government, opposition to extensive government regulation and the like. So it's got the same, it's kind of in common discourse today, you have a kind of mirror image of the, the problem of the use of the term uh, classical liberal. Uh, but also there's a much more specific problem. Uh, and here I have to uh, sort of be a bit frank really, uh, in the last 10 to 15 years, particularly in the United States, but also elsewhere. Uh, the term libertarian has come to have a slightly different meaning. Uh, the meaning has come to be contested, shall we say. Uh, and it's come to be associated with a species of uh, thinking and a political set of political ideas, which are certainly anti-state, but which are also deeply and profoundly reactionary and unliberal. Uh, and I'm sure you all know of the kind of uh, people, movements, websites, groups that I am talking about. So uh, we've even got to the extraordinary sort of situation uh, at the moment where there are one or two people out there in the wilder reaches of the internet who could be described, if you want to think of such a contradiction in terms, as a libertarian Nazi, uh, which is, tells you how bad the situation has gotten in this regard. And I think the problem here increasingly is that the word libertarian in the contemporary discourse, particularly in, on the internet, and particularly in the United States, and North America generally perhaps, has come to be associated not with um, true liberalism as such, uh, a true commitment to individual liberty, but rather with a commitment to a form of identity politics, specifically white identity politics, certainly opposition to the state, but actually I suspect mainly on the grounds that the people who think of themselves in this way aren't in charge of the political process. I suspect they'd suddenly become rather keen on it if they thought they were in charge of it. Uh, and also uh, support for highly reactionary traditional social institutions and outlooks. And this means that increasingly the term is tainted because if you use that to describe yourself, the problem is you are in the minds of your interlocutors and in the minds of the common discourse, you're associated with some other people who you simply do not want to be associated with. Uh, this is the problem of the tar baby effect, uh, as you might call it, drawing on the well-known uh, Chandler Harris story. So as it says here, the term is now, I think, quite seriously compromised. So what about the term individualist? Now, it's worth saying something, as I do here, about the actual history of the use of the term, which you can get from engrams, Google engrams, uh, but also from simply looking uh, at things like the titles of books and pamphlets. Uh, the term doesn't appear really as a term of uh, social or intellectual analysis until the 1840s uh, when it springs up uh, as the result of a number of controversies at that time. It's an example of the term I mentioned earlier where it's originally used as a term of abuse and opprobrium. Uh, individualism and individualist mean selfishness 
uh, egocentricity, self-obsession. Uh, an individualist is someone who ca doesn't care for the social or wider good, uh, is in the old New Greek sense of the word an idiot, in fact, a totally private person. Uh, but it's taken up very rapidly by the people it's described and given, it's ascribed to, and it's given a much richer, thicker meaning. And if you look at things like the engrams, you see that the use of the term individualist rises steadily and sharply until the 1890s. Then after the 1890s, it gradually increases. The number of references made to it in things like the titles of works, uh, its use in indexes, in literature texts and so on, uh, shows a gradual increase until the later 1930s. The all-time high is actually 1938-39. Uh, and then after that, there's a gradual decline. And then after 2002, it just falls off a cliff. And since 2009, according to Google Engrams, uh, it's not used at all. I find that hard to believe, by the way, uh, but that's certainly what Google uh, says is the situation. And until about 1950, it had a very widely recognized and particular meaning. It was used in political discussion, political argument, uh, by both people who defined themselves as individualists and those who saw themselves as its opponents, the self-defined collectivists, and it had a generally understood meaning. Uh, and this was why, for example, Friedrich Hayek could describe himself as one of those who supported the individualist party and tradition. So what was the meaning that it had in that period, roughly 1850 to 1950? As I say, it had a clearly understood meaning. Uh, for example, um, in the 1920s, the British freethinker Charles Cecil Delisle Burns brought out a little book called Political Ideals. And along with things like liberalism, socialism, conservatism, uh, social Catholicism, he also had a chapter on individualism. And what that shows is the degree to which it was a well-recognized and well-understood uh, intellectual and political position. And it acquired that meaning really in the course of the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, and it was defined more precisely in several countries, notably the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, Germany, and France, uh, in a whole series of debates uh, at the end of the 19th century, in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, the debate between individualism and collectivism. And if you look through old titles, uh, forgotten books and all that kind of thing. If you look through the titles of pamphlets, polemical literature of the time, you'll find that there is an absolute huge number of books which either describe themselves as being about individualism or which focus on the division between individualism and socialism or individualism and collectivism. This was a well-known polarity at the time. Also at the time, individualism was understood to be a species or distinct type of liberalism. Because at the time, the liberal tradition, if you will, the classical liberal tradition, was bifurcating. It was splitting into two parts. On the one hand, you had the so-called new liberals, uh, who you find on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, social liberals. And on the other hand, you have individualists who are not the people who are carrying on the old tradition. That's not how they either see themselves or are seen by uh, their interlocutors. They're the people who are taking that uh, old tradition further, but not in the way that the revisionist liberals were doing. They were taking it further in the direction of a particular kind and species of social political and cultural radicalism. And they gave themselves and were generally described by others as in the name of individualists and individualism as their ideology. Uh, so what did it mean? Well, it meant the following things here. Social libertarianism. In other words, strong commitment to free association, free speech, uh, personal, liberty of personal conduct, uh, liberty in terms of things like sexual relations, uh, and generally speaking, the whole array of private social conduct, laissez-faire economics, and strong opposition to the already growing regulatory state. Voluntarism, uh, meaning things like the voluntary principle in terms of political organization, bottom-up federation, in other words, as the model for political association. The voluntary principle as a way of organizing large social movements or bodies, uh, free associations coming together, then those associations in turn uh, clubbing together to form larger coordinations. The voluntary principle as a way of dealing with social problems through the formation of things like friendly societies.
anti-imperialism, opposition to imperialism. This was a very prominent feature in both uh, the United States and the United Kingdom. Most of the, the great classical liberals of the time of any kind, the particularly individualists, were vehemently opposed to imperialism. They were also opposed to militarism, uh, and there was a strong connection with peace activism, activism uh, against military adventurism and in favour of uh, either pacifism or more often very, very strict opposition to uh, the use of military force, except in the most exceptional cases, uh, and support for alternatives to it, such as international arbitration and the like. Uh, minimal politics and government. Uh, very, very limited sphere of politics, as I explained in my previous lecture. Cultural individualism and personal autonomy. Uh, it was associated, the term, very much with the idea that each person should be free to pursue and realise their own particular life plan, if you will. Uh, that you should not be uh, controlled or restrained in the choices you made in your life, not only by the government, but even more so, perhaps, by the general structures or beliefs of society. In fact, in the very radical individualists, particularly in France, there's a kind of uh, tension posited, or even outright opposition, in fact, in more extreme cases, between the individual, an individual or uh, autonomy and society. Uh, social norms are regarded with uh, doubt, if you will. Uh, there's an emphasis upon self-help uh, and a particular theory of social action and reform, uh, a particular way of understanding how you could address social problems such as alcoholism, uh, prostitution and the like, which did not involve uh, simply doing nothing, but which also did not involve the coercive use of the power of the state or of the political process, such prohibition. So there was an actually quite elaborate worked out theory of private action to alleviate social problems, uh, notably the kind of problems that were increasingly grouped together under the portmanteau term of poverty, uh, with quite an elaborate theory about how this was. And linking all of these things together in some ways, a belief in progress, a belief not only that things could get better, but that they were getting better, but also that there was still a long way to go, and an interlinked set of ideas about what had to be done to make it uh, get better. And there were some things which are commonly associated with it, uh, which in some individual cases were not, but in other cases these were perfectly fair associations. One of them was free thought and anti-clericalism. Um, now quite a few of the individualist liberals at the 19, in the 19th century were actually believers, but a lot of them were indeed free thinkers, outright atheists. It probably makes more sense to flip it the other way around, to say that most uh, free thinkers at this time, people like Ingersoll, for example, are ardent individualists. Uh, the same goes on the continent for anti-clericalism. In Catholic countries such as Mexico, lots of parts of Latin America, most of continental Europe, most individualist liberals are strongly opposed to the political and social power uh, of the church, and above all, the Catholic church, uh, particularly the Jesuit order. Uh, but that's not, all, that's not true generally, but that is a common association uh, with good reason. Another one is feminism. Uh, the great majority of uh, so-called first wave feminists uh, the feminist movement between, again, roughly the 1840s uh, and the 1900s are individualists, very often very radical individualists. And so, again, generally speaking, if you at this time, if you were to say that you were an individualist, it would be assumed and taken for granted that you had what would be regarded as advanced views on what they used to call the woman question, which is one of the big controversies of the age, the question of the uh, role, social status, political position of women. There's also very strong support for and advocacy of anti-racism in the American context, support for protecting the interests of African-Americans, uh, advocating for their civil rights, also protecting and advocating the interests of Native Americans. In the British context, uh, strong opposition to racism in the form of the various policies and the British Empire, and also of foreign continental powers, notably the Belgians and the Germans. Uh, this found expression in things like the Aboriginal Protection Society, uh, which is one of the big pressure groups at the time, many of whose members are leading figures in the individualist movement. Uh, free love is another one, uh, which means basically that you should simply form sexual relations with whoever you wanted uh, on a kind of free association basis. Uh, and this was again a very radical 
idea at the time. The most famous advocates in the United States, Moses and Lillian Harmon, but there's others as well, like Tennessee Claflin, for example. Uh, it's similarly also found in the UK in organisations like the uh, Legitimation League. Uh, the term, the term, paradoxically, some of the people in this movement are also associated with what appears to be the opposite, which is something called social purity. But in fact, there's a kind of interesting overlap or interplay between the two ideals. And also, finally, heterodox economics. Um, a lot of individualists are associated certainly with laissez-faire economics, but not necessarily with orthodox. Uh, classical or emergent neoclassical economics. So quite a lot of Georgists, for example, uh, and also there's a lot of people who are associated with very heterodox monetary economics and the criticism of what came to be increasingly called the monetary monopoly. So the point is there's a very rich, dense body of associations. It referred at this time, right through to the 1950s, this must be said, to a very coherent, radical form of liberalism. So the term individualism had this generally understood meaning. Uh, here are some of the people who uh, might, you would be defined either by themselves or by others as individualists. This is Josephine Butler, uh, one of the great individualist feminists, the woman who led the campaign in Britain to repeal the Contagious Diseases Acts. Uh, these days, her radical feminism is well known and celebrated, but her devout Christianity and also her radical anti-state individualism uh, is generally ignored and overlooked. Very um, important figure. Here's another almost forgotten, but at the time very prominent figure, Wordsworth Donisthorpe. Uh, an important figure, by the way, in the development of motion pictures. He was one of the very great early pioneers of that technology, but also an extremely radical individualist, uh, a virtual anarchist. He denied the term uh, that he was, in fact. He claimed to be just a very minimal statist, but uh, well known on both sides of the Atlantic for uh, being the most thoroughgoing and consistent individualist of his time in some ways. A famous French uh, individualist, uh, Emile Armand. He was indeed an anarchist uh, and a very prolific writer, uh, both of uh, fictional works, but also lit literary works, I should say, but also of polemical pamphlets, a leading figure uh, along with people like Octave Mirbeau in the individualist movement in France at that time. Moorfield Story, uh, the founding president of the NAACP, uh, leading figure in the campaign against American imperialism, uh, general uh, person involved in almost any kind of individualist activism you care to mention in the late 19th and early 20th century United States. Uh, a truly amazing, uh, admirable figure, but again, mostly forgotten these days, although uh, the James Perron has got his own one-man show named after him, the Moorfield Story Institute. Uh, otherwise, though, I think largely forgotten. Uh, here's someone from a slightly later date, uh, the American uh, individualist and feminist Suzanne La Follette, uh, with one of her memorable quotes there. Uh, she was the person who helped run the Freeman with Albert J. Nock in the 1920s. Uh, she also wrote a whole number of books which combined again the principles of feminism uh, and radical individualism. Uh, again, another very important figure, probably better remembered than some of the people I've uh, previously looked at. Here are some couple more recent figures who use the term. This is Frank Chodorov. Uh, he was one of the Georgists that I mentioned earlier uh, <clears throat> and uh, a figure who uh, remained active in politics right through to the early 60s. Uh, here's another quote of his, all wars come to an end temporarily, but the powers acquired by the state survive. Political power never voluntarily uh, gives up, he says. Uh, a very... Uh, true quote, I think it's fair to say. Uh, he always described himself as an individualist throughout his political career, uh, even after it had ceased to be uh, the generally accepted term for his kind of politics, which more in a moment. And here's somebody who I knew personally, uh, some of the, you watching may remember, Tibor McCann. Uh, Tibor, who died just recently, a few years ago, always described himself as an individualist. That was the label that he uh, preferred ahead of anything else. So those are, if you like, examples of the people over that period, all sharing the same kind of politics, the same kind of views, obviously with individual differences, uh, who both used the term themselves and would have been described by others using this label. So what changed? 
Um, well, as I say, up until about 1948-50, uh, individualist was the accepted term for people who uh, advocated what we now try to label as classical liberal or libertarian. And so Friedrich Hayek uses the term as late as writing in the early 1950s. Uh, many other people in the 1930s used the term. It's used widely throughout the 1940s. And then quite suddenly and abruptly, it stops. Now, it's worth saying, as I do here, that there is a distinction made throughout this period between individualism and something called aristocratic individualism. Uh, the latter is associated with people like Nietzsche, uh, the decadent movement, uh, people like uh, Anthony Ludovici. It's a different kind of political philosophy. Uh, everybody, but it was used also as by the interlocutors. So the webs, for example, would use it as well. Uh, and then quite suddenly, it stopped being used. Uh, quite abruptly, in 1950-51, the term just drops out of use as a label for that particular political position. And there are a few people, like Isabel Patterson, uh, Chod, Frank Chodrov, Tibor McCann later on, who continue to use it, but they've now become exceptional. Uh, generally speaking, everyone switches to calling themselves classical liberals, libertarians, or even, uh, heaven help us, conservative. So what happened? Well, we don't really know. Uh, I do have a purely speculative theory of my own, which is that this actually comes out of Langley, Virginia, uh, and that the sudden demise in the use of the term uh, individualist is part of the uh, wider campaign of cultural politics that the CIA was engaged in at the time, but that's pure speculation on my part. Now, why should we go back to it? My final sort of concluding point, because what I'm arguing is that this term, the old term that was used until the 1950s, is the one that we should go back to, given the problems which I've already identified with the two existing terms. What it does is it makes it very clear that you are, if you use it, that you're not the same as a conservative uh, or the soi-disant libertarians who've been infesting the conversation lately. Uh, and it also, draws attention to the foundational difference between uh, this political position and the political position of both of those other two groups, which is collectivism versus individualism. If you uh, think, say you are an individualist, you are making it very clear that you are not buying into ideas of collective identity, collective purpose, uh, and the right to, or the need to subordinate the ends, the plans, uh, the purposes of the individual to some kind of imagined collective good, which actually, in fact, typically turns out to really be the goods of certain particular individuals. But never mind that for the moment. The point is it makes it very clear where you are and it draws a clear line between other groups and other intellectual and political tendencies by making it clear that what you're talking about is a fundamental division here between those two uh, starting points. It makes it clear that you're talking about much more than just economics. Individualism, as a generally understood term, does not just mean a position in economics. It's actually thought of, in fact, more these days as being a cultural uh, and social position. And so it makes it clear that the economics, if you like, is a corollary, a secondary, albeit a very important secondary part of the wider, more general philosophy and position. It also makes, has methodological implications. It makes it very clear how you're going to go about approaching things, what the method of analysis you're going to use is, and what your theoretical starting point is. The theoretical starting point being uh, that of the individual human being, man or woman. Uh, it's a word that people, even now though, still attach a clear meaning to. Uh, now, some people have a positive meaning attached to it, other people have a negative meaning attached to it. But the point is that in both cases, they'll know where you're coming from. And this is, again, a word with um, a great history. Uh, as I said before, there's a great deal going on there uh, in the late 19th century. All kinds of interesting ideas being thought up, all kinds of uh, interesting approaches to the problems of the modern world were being developed, but many of them have actually been forgotten. And so I think there is a strong need now to revive the term individualism, to become much more self-aware uh, of ourselves, if you will, as an individualist movement with an individualist philosophy, because that will both distinguish people who have the combination of views 
I described at the start, from others who otherwise will be confused with us or even worse, pass under our colors. But it also makes it clear then about the nature of the project that we are engaged in and it enables us to uh, engabark on the project of reviving and reconstructing and taking further forward the many radical ideas that were being developed in that period that's now almost entirely forgotten intellectually between roughly the 1880s and the 1940s. Okay, Steve, so our first question is one that we got a couple times. You've got to say more about the CIA. Okay. Um, this is, this is pure speculation on my part, but actually I think there is a very interesting and big book to be written about the kind of cultural politics that the CIA engaged in, in the uh, 1950s and early 60s in particular. It went on after that as well, but that was when it was at its peak. This was basic, basically, as well as all the usual spy stuff the CIA was up to, uh, what it also had was a pretty well-funded and very elaborate uh, sort of act, set of activities in the cultural politics sphere, things like in Counter Magazine, for example, uh, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, uh, a whole lot of the sort of intellectual meetings, intellectual networking, uh, trying to influence the intellectual conversation, often with great success. Now, the goal of all this, the point of it all, from the CIA's you know perspective, was to create an anti-communist coalition. Uh, what they wanted to do uh, on both the left and the right of politics was to bring people who were opposed to communism into a big kind of tent, an anti-communist tent, and at the same time to marginalise or uh, sideline the people who were not prepared to support the Cold War, basically, for whatever reason. Uh, now, that had various sort of aspects. I mean, the, the big focus was actually on social democracy and social democrats. But as far as the American conservative movement went in particular, but also um, classical liberal radicals in Europe, um, in the United States, individualism was associated with anti-globalism, with opposition to and hostility towards an expansive globalist foreign policy on the part of the United States with uh, what was came to be called then uh, isolationism. And obviously that was not in the interests of the CIA, to put it mildly. What they wanted to do was to get everybody in that part of the rally behind the Cold War uh, agenda and the, you know, the anti-communist movement. Uh, and so I think part of that campaign, I suspect anyway, uh, was to try and blur the differences between uh, radical individualists on the one hand and uh, more kind of mainstream pro-business conservatives in the Republican Party on the other, and also to try and do down that whole tradition of, um, well, America first, as it was originally called before that term got co-opted by some seriously bad people, um, the kind of tradition of opposition to foreign entanglements on the part of the US government, which of course had been the dominant US foreign policy position until the 1930s. So I think that's what lay behind it. Uh, and as I say, this is pure speculation on my part, but I think somebody sometime ought to go out and actually, you know, do a whole lot of public uh, information requests uh, and write a book about all this because there's, it's an open secret. Nobody denies that this was going on. People like Herb Greer would responsible for all this kind of thing. Uh, and it was, it was a major part of the CIA's activities uh, to try and not exactly manipulate, but sort of like nudge and influence the political and intellectual conversation on both sides of the political spectrum in a way that would tend to um, mute certain kinds of political tendency or uh, forms of political identity that would get in the way of creating this anti-communist um, front, if you will, in that sense. So I think that's what it was. How did so many libertarians come to be seduced by nationalism? Oh, good question. Um, I honestly don't know the answer to that, really. <clears throat> it may be just part of the current zeitgeist, because at the moment there's no doubt that it's not just libertarians who are being seduced by this. A lot of people are. Uh, there's one of the things that's been happening at the moment in the last 10 years, certainly, is a big revival of nationalism generally. So it's not just libertarians. Um, in the terms of... Um, the, the, both Europe and North America, I think what's been going on is this. In, in Europe, uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, you had a lot of people who, for obvious reasons, were strongly opposed to communism, 
and to, by extension, to socialism, but at the same time were also very nationalistic because part of their experience of living under communism in countries like Bulgaria, Romania, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, and so on, was that their national independence had been crushed by the, uh, their being involved in the, in the Warsaw Pact. And so for many people in the initial sort of aftermath of the fall of the Berlin Wall in that part of Europe, there came to be a kind of clear association between anti-communism, free markets, and that kind of thing, and also nationalism. Uh, now, since then, I think what has happened is that most of the people who bought into that packet originally in Europe have gone well away from liberalism. Uh, I mean, need I mention anything more than Viktor Orban, who, let us not forget, began his political career as a liberal. And his party, Fidesz, was originally the youth wing of the Liberal Party in Hungary. My word, how things have changed, eh? Uh, so I think what has happened is that the people who've remained loyal to liberalism, if you will, have now moved away from that nationalist position. Uh, but the others have gone right down that route. So I think that's what happens in Europe. In Western Europe, you don't get that. I think libertarians have always been uh, very sceptical of nationalism in that part of Europe. In the United States, I think, it's part of the process that I described. Uh, the, um, with the Ron Paul candidacy uh, for, the, well, his two candidacies actually, for the Republican nomination, a lot of people got involved in the libertarian movement. And many of these people were attracted to a kind of, well, it's interesting given what I was saying a moment ago, a kind of America first nationalism, basically. Uh, and that sort of nationalism, what you might call old right uh, nationalism, if you will, uh, tended to bring with it a whole, a lot of strong attachment to uh, a particular vision or notion of the United States as a nation state. Uh, and that I think has since gone on to develop and have its own generally rather bad influence on uh, a lot of libertarians in the United States. So I think that's what's going on there. So I think there are two slightly different stories on either side of the Atlantic, but they're, they're partly historically contingent, I think. Uh, it, it's a result of the way politics has developed in both of those parts of the world over the, the last 15, 20 years. What distinguishes republicanism, either in its classical sense or its neo-republican sense, thinking here of folks like Philip Pettit, what distinguishes that uh, strand of republicanism from classical liberalism or modern liberalism. Yeah, there's a big overlap uh, in terms of specific issues, you might say, but there's a fundamental difference between republicanism, classical republicanism, civic humanism, uh, or the philosophy of people like Philip Pettit or Cass Sunstein and liberalism, uh, which they would be the first to say, by the way, you know, they, they don't claim to be liberals at all. Quite the contrary, they see themselves as being, um, you know, critical of liberalism. Same would be true of other important thinkers like say, Hannah Arendt, um, who's one of the founders of this kind of neo-republicanism. The difference is this fundamentally, and it goes back to what I said in my lecture last week. For classical Republicans, the key political question, the key question of political philosophy is, how should a self-governing people organize their affairs? So the key idea in republicanism is the idea of a well-ordered political commonwealth. Um, it's fundamentally a theory of life in which politics is seen as being an essential part of the good life. Uh, I alluded earlier on to the classical Greek idea that somebody who was not interested in politics and had no interest in public affairs was an idiot. Uh, that's what the word actually means in classical Greek. An idiot is not what it means today. It means somebody who's a purely private person who doesn't care about public affairs. And so the classical Republican tradition holds that if you are to be a full human being, uh, if you are to fully realize yourself, you have to do so as as part of a self-governing uh, political community, a republic. Uh, the, that's what the word means. The republic is the res publica, the public thing. Uh, the, the, not, not so much the state, it's the whole body of the organized public life. And so that's a profoundly non-liberal way of thinking. Um, because obviously, as I said last week, the whole essence of liberalism is to argue that the sphere of politics, collective discursive decision-making should be minimized and that you should rely more upon private decision making uh, and really keep the, you know, only, only have, have that as the default and only have the political process as uh, a peculiar and special area. Whereas for uh, Republicans, there's an expansive notion of politics, not necessarily an expansive notion of government. Uh, there are quite a lot of small government Republicans, but they want to have an expansive notion of politics. Uh, and so that's why that's, that's the difference. It's a very big one. Like I said, Philip Pettit wouldn't deny that. I mean, he'd be the first person to say exactly what I've just said, I'm sure. <laughs>
relatedly, how should we separate the language of individualism from the connotations, uh, many of which are coming from these Republican folks, related mm -hmm. to selfishness, callousness, atomism, those sorts of yeah. things? I think the association with um, selfishness is, is quite easily rebutted. The, the one that's more serious because it, it tends to stick and it's got a sort of like, lock, but the long pedigree and a wide kind of popular notion is the idea of social atomism, the, the kind of straw man vision of individualism, which is that um, if you're an individualist, you think that it's a case of, oh, I'll do what the hell I like and to hell with anybody else or uh, every person for themselves and the devil take the hindmost and a completely asocial vision of human life, which is, simply indefensible because it, it doesn't take more than a moment's reflection to realize that human beings are social animals and do not live like Robinson Crusoe's and so on. Uh, so the, 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 that, is, that is the big challenge. And the challenge, I think, is to show that actually uh, individualism properly understood means uh, people living as self-directed individuals but embedded in relations with other people and it's only through those relations with other people that you actually achieve or realize yourself and therefore are free so is Robinson Crusoe free well yeah in some ways he is because there's nobody to tell him what to do he's entirely on his own he can't tell anybody else what to do either until man friday appears but on the other hand is he truly free well no there's a whole number of things he would want to do to realize himself of you which he can't do because he's on that desert island and he's much more aware in fact of how constrained his situation is the fact that he's in some sense a prisoner on this island uh, and his whole obsessive thing is about trying to escape from the desert island because he feels he's not a fully human being where he is out there on his own so um individualism does not you know what you have to do is to show that individualism goes along with a particular theory of social action uh social existence but above all social action uh because i think the really uh, bad association connotation the word is that it means basically not being concerned about the interests of others just only being focused on your own interests um narrowly defined egoism i think it's a misconception of egoism as well but that's another matter and i think the thing the way to do that is to emphasize the the voluntary principle which i've alluded to before voluntarism the idea that uh, actually you are always going to be engaged in other regarding actions uh it's what you should do as a good person uh, and that you're always going to be engaged in you know lots and lots of public activity it's just will be done on the basis of voluntary cooperation voluntary action and i think ultimately that's an area where um a, one action is worth a thousand words so as well as writing pamphlets or maybe even preferably instead of writing pamphlets what you should do is actually go and do things uh, and make it clear that this is part, you know, part, part of and fits in with your political and social philosophy. Uh, deeds carry much greater weight and are much more apparent, I think, to outside observers than words. Continuing this thread, in what sort of positive social duties have individualists believed? Oh, a whole range of things. I mean, the obvious, uh, there are both negative and positive duties. Now, um, so the negative duty, obviously, is not to do bad stuff to other people, basically. Uh, but the, the, ar the other argument is, is that, yes, you do have positive duties. You have a duty of benevolence, basically. Uh, now, what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, if the default view you should take of other people is that you wish them well, uh, you do not want to see bad things happen to them. And to the extent that it's in your power and does not harm yourself too much, you should seek to assist them uh, and to, um, you know, help them out, if you will, either on your own or in collaboration with others. Uh, so there are different ways of justifying this. Now, um, if you are going to base your individualism on ethical egoism uh, as an objectivist a, a randian would then you have to justify this in terms of your own self-interest basically you have to say that self-interest rightly understood in a top billion phrase means that you should take this view but there are other positions so uh, you could be a can there's plenty of kantian individualists uh, and obviously that's a duty-based ethical philosophy but for for kant um treating other people as uh, you know, mean uh, not as means, but as ends in themselves, 
involves a duty of benevolence and respect towards them, which goes beyond simply not doing bad stuff to them. It involves helping them, uh, doing things collaboratively with them and so on. Uh, and there's also, you know, uh, many other philosophies. Confucianism, to give just one example, uh, the concept of benevolence or ren is a central one in Confucianism. And that again leads to the idea that well beyond um, any uh, kind of you know duty you owe to government you have duties in the confucian philosophy mainly to your family but leaving that aside to your fellow human beings uh, which involve things like helping the unfortunate um or uh, if you've you know the sort of quintessential story you've you come across a stranger who's in trouble uh you don't just walk by on the other side because uh that would make you a bad person now that's that's fully understood as part of a you know position of individualism How do you see the link between cosmopolitanism and individualism? They're absolutely inextricably interlinked. I should have actually put that in my list because uh, that's the flip side of the anti, uh, anti-imperialism, uh, which is a support for cosmopolitanism uh, and uh, for a kind of unity of human respect uh, and so there's a very close connection actually not that the people involved are aware of it between uh, the radical classical liberals late 19th century and contemporary theorists of cosmopolitanism like uh, Anthony Appiah or Saila Ben Habib and people like that the arguments are very very similar and particularly quite uh, Anthony Appiah's arguments I think that they're, they're, they could easily be put straight into that, that tradition and so I think if you look at the re- re- writings of contemporary uh, theorists, people like Chandra and Kukathas, you can get some idea of what this means, how it works. So one of the central ideas of uh, individualists is opposition to borders, basically, uh, defined in a very wide sense, uh, and opposition to controls on movement, because historically, one of the great liberal campaigns was to get rid of controls on movement. What we forget these days is that up until well into the 19th century, in many parts of Europe, right up until you know the end of the 19th century in some places, you weren't allowed to move around freely within a state uh, in many cases. And so campaigns for freedom of movement were an essential part of the whole liberal movement uh, and the individualists were particularly associated with that. Now, that translates in the modern context into support for freedom of movement, um, generally speaking, not just within the bounds of a political entity. So there's a very strong moral, ethical, social, ph- no, philosophical connection between um, individualism, radical liberalism, and the ideal of cosmopolitanism. Uh, and this, this goes back a long way. You could argue it even goes all the way back to people like the Stoics, uh, who've got both a form of ethical individualism and also cosmopolitanism. The whole idea of the citizen of the world is something you find in Epictetus and the other uh, classical Stoic philosophers. So this is a very old kind of association, the association between uh, psychological, cultural, philosophical individualism and uh, an a kind of being attached to all human beings in a much more general way uh, is is a, a very long-standing one. So it's an inherent, very tight connection. Now, this means, of course, that this is one of the areas where the, the principle is under the most severe attack right now. Um, as you said at the start, suddenly nationalism has become very modish uh, at the moment. And so this is one of the big current battlegrounds, I think. Does the centrality of the concept of liberty within liberalism, liberty being sort of a slippery concept and meaning different things to different people. Um, Does the focus of liberty within the liberal tradition uh, lend itself toward liberalism being harder to find, harder to define and articulate? Um, Well, I think think I'm the question I think you're going off is saying, does it make it harder to make a political argument about it? Yes. Uh, the answer is yes, I think it does. Um, and the reason is because of the way that political discussion and political argument is understood at the moment. And I'll refer back to what I said in my previous lecture, really. Virtually all of the other ways of approaching the question of politics uh, political questions about how should government be organized, what's the nature of political authority, all these kind of questions, uh, they all start from the presumption that there is a political sphere. And what you then do uh, is work out what isn't in it. So the default, the the sphere of non-politics is defined negatively. 
as being the sphere of life that politics is not concerned with. Whereas the liberal tradition works the other way around. Politics is defined as the sphere of life that is uh, not part of the individual uh, choice sphere, which otherwise is taken to be everything. It's the default such setting, if you will. Now, the problem with that is it means that liberalism is not exactly an anti-political doctrine because it does allow a, a sphere for politics, but it's one where that's not the starting point. And that actually means that um, what you have to do is to the burden of proof, if you like, for a liberal is put upon the person who wants to argue that a certain part of life should be subject to the political process. And that means that liberal arguments about certain areas of life are either going to be um, simply saying, no, they should not be concerned with politics at all, or they're going to have to start off by making a case as to why this area should be subject to politics and then go on to say in what way, to what extent and all the rest of it. And that gives them, uh, uh, makes it slightly clumsy, I think. Now, what I would say is that in political argument generally, political debate generally, it is always better making positive arguments than negative arguments. Um, you're always going to be more persuasive uh, making a positive argument, it seems to me, than if you're making simply a negative argument, argue, arguing why something should not be done. Not that those kind of arguments aren't important and necessary, but it's simply as a matter of like rhetoric, if you will. Now, I think that therefore what you need to do if you are coming from an individualist position is to make not just make negative arguments as to why certain parts of life should not be subject to the political decision-making process, you have to make a positive argument as to how they are naturally expressed best or governed best through the, the, the world of private choice and aggregated choice. Uh, and I think that's, that's, the, that's the challenge. And so the problem at the moment is that the default assumption of all of the arguments that we get and all the discussions we get is that something should be subject to politics. So whenever we have a social problem, uh, the starting point of all the arguments is, well, OK, what should we do about this? And the we is implicitly assumed to mean the political community, i.e. government. Now, uh, the obvious thing you have to do if you're a liberal is say, well, hold on a minute. Why does that we not mean just the we who are having this conversation or we in the sense of people who choose to get involved in this. In other words, you have to question the whole presumption that uh, the default position for any kind of thing that you're talking about should be politics. And that's a difficult case to make at the moment because people are hardwired to approach it that way. So yes, there is a difficulty, but it's unavoidable. How would the individualist think about some recent social movements like Me Too, Black Lives Matter, that sort of thing? Um, in uh, different ways, really. Uh, it depends on which aspect of movements like that you're talking about. Um, in one sense, um, these are classic individualist movements, raising individualist concerns, because they're raising concerns about things like equality before the law, individual autonomy, uh, very much in the case of Me Too, uh, you know, uh, unwanted sexual advances or harassment are a serious infringement on your personal autonomy. Uh, so the, the kind of uh, their movements which are addressing issues that matter if you're an individualist, uh, you know, having agents of the state uh, treat certain categories of people differently to others, uh, being shot, uh, you know, in ways that are, well, would be illegal in any well-governed state, I think it's fair to say. Um, th those are obviously concerns. On the other hand, I think what you might well uh, be more worried about is or concerned about critical of perhaps is the association of these perfectly well-founded arguments and concerns with particular forms of collective identity politics the crucial thing being there the assertion that some in identities are radically unchosen now it's a fact that lots of identities are unchosen to a greater or lesser degree but if you're an individualist you want to if you like reduce the range and scope of unchosen identity you want to move towards a world where to the greatest degree possible identity is something that you create through your own choices and actions rather than something that is ascribed to you by other people uh, or over which you have no control or say and i think you can make a strong case for saying that over the last 200 years the sphere of 
choice-based identity has grown for both social and technological reasons, whereas the sphere of ascribed or uh, unchosen identity, natural identity you might call it, uh, although I think that's a questionable term, but there you go, natural identity has diminished. Um, and, but what I think we have at the moment is a rather kind of curious mixed up argument where you have you know, I think perfectly well-founded and reasonable attacks upon things uh, which are, you know, uh, should be severely criticised on individualist grounds. But very often the argument made for, you know, being concerned about these infringements of individual autonomy or rights come from the basis of uh, the idea that certain people have an identity which is completely unchosen by them. And the answer to that should be, well, yes, that may be true, but uh, you need to work against that. And in any case, that's not the basis on which you should argue uh, that certain kinds of things are simply intolerable, insufferable, and should be dealt with. Relatedly, how would the individualists think about intersectionality? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I, but now, this is where there's, there's disagreement, I think it's fair to say. It depends what you think that concept is and um, what, what it means. Now, uh, there's a disagreement on this issue between uh, me and some other people. I'm sure you won't mind my mentioning his name in this context, Phil Magnus, for example. So Phil is of the opinion that to the extent that the arguments that Kimberly Crenshaw and others make when the idea was first formulated, uh, intersectionality that is, to the extent that those arguments are true, they're trivially true. Uh, and that there's a whole lot of intellectual baggage, uh, which is anti-liberal, which is an inherent and necessary part of that concept. I disagree with Phil about this. I think that actually uh, the baggage, uh, which I certainly accept the existence of, um, is not a necessary or inherent part of the concept. The concept is rather about the way in which uh, certain ascribed identities, to go back to that, uh, can affect individuals' life chances, life opportunities, uh, the nature of the social interactions they become engaged in the nature of their discourse with other people in ways that are structurally negative. And then because people typically have multiple identities or identities on multiple axes, if you will, uh, these interact with each other in all kinds of complicated ways. Now, uh, that's Kimberly Crenshaw's basic point, as I understand it. Uh, and that seems to me to be a true and B, a, a quite an insightful one, because it, it enables you to work out both how, with, I think with much more sophistication, both how um, socially constructed disadvantage and socially constructed advantage works. Because it's worth saying, we tend to think of intersectionality always in terms of disadvantage. So there's this kind of talk about how it means you have a kind of a hierarchy of being disadvantaged, which I think is actually not what the concept meant originally, even if that's how it's used now. Um, but also it works the other way as well. That there are lots of people who uh, have intersectional advantage because they happen to be in multiple categories that bring, um, you know, un undeserved advantage, if you will, in the world. Uh, and so it, I think it's a powerful analytical tool for thinking about what if you're an individualist is a very interesting and also, you know, challenging question, which is the question of how certain kinds of inherited social structure norms uh, ascribed identities and the like can affect the uh, the life paths of individuals without anybody actually doing anything consciously or deliberately. It's a kind of emergent order, which in this case can have uh, effects that you probably don't want from the individual's point of view, because it leads to um, people facing barriers, or on the other hand, perhaps having ladders, uh, kind of game of snakes and ladders, if you will, uh, which, which uh, are none of their doing. Uh, so. Uh, you, you, the obvious point of that kind of analysis would then be to think, well, OK, how do you, you know, you know reduce both the uh, both the snakes and the ladders, I think. The last couple questions come from students proposing some alternatives, perhaps, to using the term oh, yeah. individualist. So uh, the first one is political skepticism, the idea that one is skeptical of political authority yeah. and power. And the second uh, gets to one that you've used already in the Q&A, which is uh, voluntarism. Yeah, um, I, I like the term of voluntarism. Uh, the only problem is that it's not as widely known. Uh, I tend to think myself also that voluntarism is uh, a philosophy of social action and 
which, which is a particular part or aspect of the wider category of individualism. But yes, it's a, it's a good term. The problem is that nobody knows what it is these days at all, apart perhaps from people who've studied uh, historical ecclesiology, theories of church governance, because it has a specific meaning in, in that context. Whereas individualism, um, despite the fact that it's a historical term, still has a con lot of use in contemporary uh, language. People know what the word means. So that, that's why I, I, I like voluntarism. I, I, I wouldn't use it except as a specific sub definition. Now as to scepticism, well yeah I mean I'm a political skeptic myself and I think that scepticism at politics is uh, a crucial part of the individualist position. Uh, the thing is though that you can't simply get away with saying um, I'm, I'm a political skeptic, I'm, I have skeptical doubts about the capacity of collective human action, about the capacity of human reason to understand the world, the full kind of Hayekian or Nassim Nicholas Taleb range of views, if you will. The problem with that is that it's not only individualists who are skeptical uh, in that sense. A lot of conservatives are too. In fact, you could make a strong case for saying that it's one of the core values of most types of conservatism is skepticism about the, the power of reason. Uh, and so I, I think that while certainly you would you would want to emphasize that as an aspect of the classical liberal or individualist approach to politics, skepticism about grand or abstract political ideas, that's one of those ideas that is actually shared with other traditions, uh, particularly with conservatism, but also with certain forms of you know, libertarian socialism as well. So it's it's a it's a useful tool again and I wouldn't use it as a label for that reason again it's too it's too ill-defined I think